But today we want to talk about the Chinese treasure ships. How many of you all have seen this book before? 1421 by Gavin Menzies. It was a bestseller. Um, this book purports to present evidence that China, Chinese sailing ships, reached America 70 years before Christopher Columbus. And not only that, but that these Chinese ships circumnavigated the globe well before Magellan did, and that they discovered the Arctic and Australia and all sorts of other things, and that they were responsible for actually settling parts of America, of delivering to the Americas some of the crops, which became important later on, and then taking back crops to Asia, which were planted and became valuable. Um, all of this is based upon the premise that Columbus and Magellan and others, uh, when they made their voyages in the 15th century and 16th century, that they actually had maps, that they knew where they were going and they knew what they were gonna find when they got there. And that those maps, um, the claim was that one of those maps is currently in the Vatican Library, the other was in the Library of the King of Spain, and those, those rather complete maps came from the mid-1400s, again, well before Columbus uh, reached America. Of course, nobody believes Columbus was, a, well, nobody, virtually nobody, and some people believe anything, but um, <laughs> most people acknowledge the fact now that Columbus, whether you believe this about the Chinese or not, was not the first one to make it to the New World. The Vikings, we have clear evidence now that the Vikings were the first ones to get there as far as we know. But the claim in this book by Gavin Menzies and some others is that China discovered the New World and much, in fact, as he says, uh, the year China discovered the world. The idea is that they had massive fleets of ships and whether or not the idea of them reaching the Americas and discovering all these other things is true or not, that it is a fact, a proven fact, that they did have massive fleets that in the early 1400s were sailing out and that's what we want to talk about today. By the way, Gavin Menzies has a second book 1434, which is the year China went to Italy and started the Renaissance. <laughs> I understand his next book is going to be about how the ancient Chinese invented the internet, but we'll wait for that one. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding, but there's some fascinating stuff in this. I read this book quite a few years ago. Um, at the start of the 15th century, that is the early 1400s, China had already been extending their sea power around East Asia for 300 years or more. They, were, uh, they worked a lot with Southeast Asian and Muslim traders, because Muslim traders were very active through the Indian Ocean, in order to be able to both trade the goods that they produced and also to access goods that uh, others uh, were made available from the West. The, particularly, they, worked, uh, they traded in ginseng, lacquerware, celadon, gold and silver, horses and oxen, hardwoods, ivory, ginger, sulfur, tin, cloves, nutmeg, pearls, cardamom, cinnamon, turmeric, pepper, gemstones, woolens, carpets, agricultural crops, etc. There was huge opportunity for trade. The reason I read that long list is because you get the idea that there are a lot of things going back and forth for the 300 years prior to the 1400s. But um, the, the thing that has been discovered, the, the formal records were destroyed, but there is significant evidence now that in the early 1400s, the Chinese built a fleet of up to 300 vessels, and then in the first third of the uh, 1400s, first, first third of the 15th century, those ships went out, large fleets of those ships went out on seven different voyages to Southeast Asia, the Indian Ocean, and to African ports. Um, most interesting about that is that at least 60 of those ships, which were called treasure ships, were enormous vessels. In fact, these um, treasure ships were, at least 60 of them, were up to 450 feet long, which to give you an idea, that would be a wooden ship as long as the Star Legend. That's almost exactly the length of this ship. Only they were much larger because they were 160 feet wide. I mean, you've got the whole width of the vessel right here because we've got windows on both sides. Imagine if that was 160 feet wide and the same length. Um, these, uh, these treasure ships had nine masts and 12 sails. They um, were, and we had accounts in various written records from the people that were involved in these, these trips. I'll explain in a few minutes why the official records were destroyed because of, of uh, various kinds of conflict within China. But 
the, uh, not only do we have that written evidence, but we also have an indication because in the Nanjing shipyards, which were the largest shipyards in the world in the early 1400s, they had discovered tillers, which is what this lower left picture is, that are over 36 feet long, which means for them to reach from the back of the ship, uh, an external post tiller to reach from there to the sea would, would only be explained by a ship of that kind of size. They've also recovered anchors which are far larger than any ordinary ship of that time would have uh, had available. So the idea was that there were hundreds of ships, and at least 60 of them, these ginormous uh, treasure ships, that went out in the early uh, 1400s. Now, all of these were the product of the Ming Dynasty. The Ming Dynasty, and of course I have this vase up here because Ming Dynasty is probably known to most people by their, their ceramics. A Ming vase is sort of representative of a rare and beautiful piece of art. They always break them in the, you know, in, in the adventure movies and things like that. Some Ming vase is going to get broken somewhere along the way. But the Ming Dynasty was the last ethnically Han <coughs> Dynasty. In other words, the ethnically Chinese. The one before them, the dynasty before them, had been the Mongol dynasty, the Huans, uh, with Kublai Khan initiating that dynasty. The ones after the Ming dynasty were the, uh, the, the last dynasty, the Cheng dynasty, was actually a Yurkins from Manchuria. They were not ethnic Hans. And so this, the Ming dynasty stands out. The third Ming emperor, whose name was Zhu Di, that may be why he got mad about stuff, Zhu Di was his name. Uh, Judy was called the Yongle Emperor, and he was very aggressive during his regime in trying to both conquer the areas around China, um, and especially to the north and to the west. He was committed to having every other nation acknowledge that China was the, uh, the most powerful nation in the world, and that he, therefore, was the Lord under all of heaven, which is the title he took for himself. So China's superiority, he wanted to broadcast that in very real ways by attacking the countries around China, seeking to uh, take them over, and then by sending out ships to other areas to convince them of just how awesome China was. And that was the reason for these large fleets and for these, uh, especially the large ships and the treasure ships. Um, he did most of his campaigning, leading of the armies, into the north against the Mongol peoples, but he sent other generals east and south and then to sea as well. This is the general that built the, for, the Forbidden City. If you've ever been to Beijing, to the Forbidden City, he's the one that built that. He's also the one that um, lengthened and widened and made practical the Grand Canal, which connected parts of China so that they could move grain and other commodities in, internal to China. Now, there's a reason why Zhu Di was so ambitious to uh, get recognition and acknowledgement. Much of it had to do with the desire to gain legitimacy. Um, the, he, first, he came from a rather questionable parentage. His father was the first of the Ming emperors, and when they conquered the Wans and took over, um, his father inherited the concubines of the former Mongol ruler. And when the, those concubines came over, the story had always been that one of them was already carrying a child who was a child of the Mongol ruler, and so therefore, when Judy was born, a lot of people believe that he, he actually was an illegitimate son. But he was accepted as the third son of the emperor um, Zhu Wangzhang. Zhu Wangzhang was the first Ming emperor. Well, Zhu Di was accepted as the third son, but he was much more capable and much more courageous, which might have been another indication of his Mongol blood, you know, that he, he was quite assertive. Um, he was much more courageous than his older brother. But Confucian principles, I've, talk, I've said a couple times, Confucian principles sometimes prevented advancement because they were so emphatic about the fact that you stayed in your place. Well, Confucian principles insisted that the eldest son must be the heir, whether he was really the most competent or not. And so um, anything else could have sparked a civil war because Confucian scholars were very powerful in the, the Chinese court at that time. Well, in 1392, uh, Zhu Bao, who was Zhu Di's older brother, died of an illness, and his father decided that the heir to the throne, rather than going to uh, his younger son, would go to the grandson. 
um, his grandson. In other words, the son of the older brother that died. So that meant that even though he was the right age and he was dynamic and courageous and energetic and skilled, that Jude was passed over for the throne in favor of his nephew. Again, because of Confucian principles. It was very clearly lined out in Confucian doctrine who would, who, what the line of, um, of inheritance was. Well, in 1398, the emperor, the first emperor, um, Judy's father, died. And when he died, his grandson, the nephew of Judy, this fellow, became the emperor. Um, once the, his father was dead, Judy was not prepared to take to accept that. So in 1402, he marched on Nanjing to do battle against the troops of his nephew in order to take over as emperor. And he was successful in that effort. But uh, the story is that as he entered the Forbidden City, the palace where the emperor and his wife and son were in residence um, burst into flames and that the emperor was died, uh, the emperor was killed in that, that is the legitimate emperor, so that Judy did, no longer had competition. The problem was, or the, the rumors were, that one, that Judy had had him killed, and had them, you know, tied up and then set the place on fire. They did find three bodies afterwards, but there was always a rumor that the, uh, the emperor, Judy's nephew, survived and went off into monastic life somewhere. At any rate, what this meant that at age 42, Judy became the emperor, but that according to uh, Confucian principles, he was never accepted as legitimate by many of the people, certainly not the Confucian scholars, because he had actively rebelled against the rightful emperor who was his nephew. Um, he declared when he took over as emperor at age 42 that he would, his, his era would be called the, uh, the, the Yongle, Dynasty. Yongle, he would be the Yongle Emperor. Yongle means uh, perpetual happiness. And as soon as he was made Emperor of Perpetual Happiness, he killed dozens of people who were seen as possible competition to him. Okay? Uh, so he comes in, he takes over, he moves the capital to Beijing officially. It had been in Nanjing. Um, but he always struggled with this idea of legitimacy that people should recognize that he truly was a legitimate, legitimate emperor. And that's one of the reasons he seemed to be so aggressive in trying to push out um, to other countries and gain recognition from other places uh, by sending out these ships. So between 1403 and 1407, they, at Judy's orders, they built 1,600 ships. Um, and to give you some idea, at the height of the Ming Navy, they had 3,500 3, ocean-going ships. The United States Navy has 300. So it gives you some idea the scale of uh, travel that they were doing. He also, at that point, recruited his friend and his favorite general, whose name was Ma He, um, to lead this giant fleet, and he gave him the new honorific name, uh, Zhang He. This is that fellow. Fascinating story. Born Ma He, or Ma He, Ma means Muhammad. He was Muslim. Uh, he came from a, the, a southwestern province of Yunnan, and he came from a Muslim family. The Hui tribes in um, China have always been Muslim, Islamic. And so, well, at least since, since Islam started. Um, because Mahi's father had supported the previous Mongol emperor, he was killed. Mahi was uh, captured, he was turned into a eunuch, and was sent to the capital city at age 10 in order to become a serving boy. He ended up uh, serving in the household of the Prince of Yan, who happened to be Judy. They grew up together and became close friends and confidants. And um, the Mahe, later on named Zhang He, he was an enormous man. He stood, uh, by all records, about six feet, six inches tall huge chest. They say that when he barked orders aboard ship, it was like the bellowing of a bull. But he was extremely intelligent and very talented. And as a eunuch, he uh, continued up the ranks of authority, uh, particularly in military matters and also in uh, literary matters. He was well known as a scholar. He achieved, in fact, the highest rank of any eunuch ever in uh, Chinese history. Well, because he was close friends with Judy and he was trained in military, he became the general of Judy's army when they defeated Judy's nephew and made Judy the emperor.
As a reward, the emperor gave him a mansion in Beijing and gave him the honorific title Zhang He. He then assigned Zhang He to com command this fleet of vessels that he commissioned to have built. Um, and in 1405, they began these famous uh, voyages. Now, again, Judy is concerned about legitimacy problems. So he takes his best friend and best general, the one that had, had led his troops in gaining the imperial role, and makes puts him in charge of these voyages. In 1405, the first uh, sailing of these ships occurred in there was 317 ships and 28,000 men in this first sailing in 1405. The goal was both to project the uh, power, to, to make everyone just awed about the, the greatness of Judy and of China, and also to collect tribute uh, to come back. During his voyages, uh, Zhang He negotiated trade agreements, he fought pirates, he installed puppet kings in regimes uh, where they, the initial ruler, the ruler when he got there, was not willing to accept China's authority, and so he, he had them replaced. He brought back tributes of jewels, medicine, exotic animals from as far away as the Persian Gulf. And because he was Muslim, he also visited a number of the Muslim shrines, including a visit to Mecca and Medina. So uh, he took advantage of that as the leader of the expedition and a Muslim. Because of how Judea had come to power, the Confucian scholars would not accept him, and they would not accept the, um, the re they destroyed the records of the, these travels. It's only from the written private records of people that were involved in these voyages that we had the initial stories. And then later on, as I say, they were corroborated by some of the findings at the Nanjing shipyard. But the, um, the written accounts in crew members' stories also, there are stone markers that were left carved in Chinese in various places acknowledging their visits to these areas. And in quite a few of the cities that they visited, they left behind uh, children with distinctively Chinese features from, I mean, these were sailors after all, right? And so they ended up with illegitimate children spread all over the place. Uh, this is a temple in Indonesia that's dedicated to Admiral Zhang He of Ming China. And there are statues and various other ways that he is commemorated throughout China as one of the great leaders of Chinese history. Now, to give you some idea, I said these ships were big. This model in the front is a scale model of the Santa Maria, one of the ships, the largest of the ships that Columbus traveled in. At the same scale, this is one of the Chinese treasure ships. Um, nothing like it has ever been seen. In fact, early on, before they really got all of the written evidence and then found some of the physical, uh, archaeological evidence for it, there were scholars who said it was not possible to build a wooden ship of that size. And yet, apparently they did. And uh, we have a lot of evidence of that now. The China had for centuries been the top naval power in Asia, and they projected that they had advanced navigation, propulsion, their, their sail system was much more advanced. They had um, the naval architecture, they had really perfected in many ways. They, were, they had magnetic compasses two centuries before they had magnetic compasses in Europe. They had star charts and other navigation tools that were printed that they could follow. Uh, so they had very clear navigational tools. These giant ships uh, were built with double hulls, and that did two things. One, it protected them from, uh, in case they were rammed, which was a common, you know, if a ship was attacked in those days, being rammed by another ship was one of the ways uh, they combat, one of the primary combat tactics. Well, the double hull meant they were protected from being rammed because if you broke out the uh, outer hull, the inner hull would still be intact. And in between those two hulls, they had watertight compartments. So not only protected, but they could take some of those compartments and fill them with water so that they had fresh water on the voyage. Some of them they filled with salt water, and as they caught fish, they would keep the fish alive in these various salt water tanks so that they had um, nutrition. Now again, they carried their own water, they, um, and when they traveled, there were 60 of these huge ships, but they generally had 300 or so additional ships that carried water and horses and um, foodstuffs and cannon and all manner of other things. 
So these were huge uh, fleets of ships that were going out. The, these ships had a stern post rudder, which was a novel invention that could be adjusted depending upon the, um, the depth of the water that they were in. The sail design and rigging was very advanced. It was larger and more efficient than European ships. They had a V-shaped hull, unlike most junks, which had a flat hull, and that made them very stable in the water, a very long keel, heavy ballast, so they traveled very, very well in rough seas. So in many, many ways, these were not only the largest, but the most advanced ships that had ever been created. The, uh, in Nanjing today, there is a treasure shipyard park in which they have built scale models, um, I mean, still large enough to climb on, but scale models nonetheless, of these various ships. Um, the ships, as you can sort of see here, those are cannon ports. There were about 200 cannon on each of these ships, smaller cannon, but then they had other, other uh, ships that carried larger weapons. But 200 small cannons still did fairly well. And they did, they fought pirates. Um, they, there were a number of times in which they did do battle. These ships had four full decks. Um, in fact, these are images from the constructed models and you get some idea how much room there was in these things. So they had four decks. Each of the treasure ships could carry 2,500 tons of cargo. Um, they, as I say, they were accompanied by several hundred smaller ships carrying water, troops, horses, cannon, trade goods like silks, brocades, porcelains, lacquerware, tea, ironworks. This was quite an extraordinary endeavor. Um, of the seven voyages, the first one began in 1405 and lasted uh, until 1407. It was 317 ships and 28,000 men. Now, that included obviously sailors, because we're talking about 317 ships, but they also had soldiers, diplomats, medical personnel, astronomers, scholars of foreign ways, and especially scholars of Islamic uh, culture, because they knew they would be uh, running into that. The, this, gives you, this map gives you an idea of the various ports beginning in Nanjing to go down the coast of China, down into Malaysia, um, down and then back up again into the Indian Ocean, to various ports along India's coast. The first voyage went to Calicut, or what we know as Calcutta, and back again. But this shows the various locations of the various uh, voyages. So the second voyage was 1407 to 1409. The third voyage was 1409 to 1411, and it had 30,000 troops and uh, 48 of the large ships plus accompanying. The fourth voyage uh, was 1413 to 1415. You get the idea. They would come back from one of these, and then in very short order, perhaps in a year, they would go back out again. Um, 1421 to 22, they had the sixth voyage, the fifth voyage I didn't mention. Um, they had brought 17 heads of state from various countries to visit China so that they could be duly impressed by the emperor and all of the riches of the Forbidden City and the, the capital city. And so the fifth voyage was to take them back again. They returned 17 heads of state back to their uh, homes. Well, after the sixth voyage uh, in 1421, a number of things happened, or actually during the sixth voyage. In 1421, the favorite senior wife of the emperor, Judy's favorite wife, died. That was seen as a bad sign. Then two concubines and a eunuch were caught having sex in the uh, private quarters of the concubines. Once before, after a talk, somebody said, wait a minute, two concubines and a eunuch were having sex? How does that work? <laughs> My only response is there is more than one way to skin a cat. <laughs> so that was a horrendous violation. In fact, thousands of eunuchs, concubines, and other staff were executed because of that, uh, of, of that happening and the fear that there might be more of that sort of thing going on. Then, again, this is all fairly early in 1421, a horse, a horse that had belonged to Tamerlane, the great conqueror, um, threw the emperor and crushed his hand. Then three bolts of lightning struck the main palace in the, uh, the Forbidden City and set it on fire. All of this stuff happening all at once, the Confucian scholars told the emperor, see, this is because you have been uh, untrue to Confucian principles. You took over from your nephew by military force. 
and you're sending out all of the, you're spending all this money on all these giant ships and all these voyages because it was costing, as you can well imagine, fortunes to send these people out. Um, and so the emperor uh, sort of renounced all of that. He remitted some of the grain taxes for the year. He promised to cut expenses, especially he promised that when the current fleet of treasure ships came back, because this was the they had just gone out that year, uh, and they usually would be gone two to three years. He said that he would stop all these foreign, uh, expensive foreign adventures and not use the treasure fleet anymore. Well, not too long after that, late in 1421, the uh, ruler of the Tatars, which was a group that paid tribute, it was one of the tribute nations to the Chinese, he sent word that he wasn't going to pay tribute anymore, which infuriated the emperor, Judi. And so Judi decided to launch a massive and massively expensive expedition, ended up being several expeditions, to uh, find, because the Tatars were a nomadic people, first you had to find them before you could defeat them, uh, to try to find them and, and defeat them as an example to what would happen to anybody who tried to uh, refuse to pay tribute to the Chinese emperor. Well, um, he went out and as he started these expeditions, his ministers were very vocal in their opposition. Didn't you just say that you weren't going to do these expensive foreign adventures anymore? Well, as a result of their opposition to him, six of the leading ministers in the country either were, sent, were imprisoned or were forced to commit suicide. He was, not, he was not in the mood to listen to all of that on top of everything else that happened. Well, in 1429, eight years later, as he was returning from one of, just one of the expeditions against the Tatars, and they never did find them, by the way, um, he dies and is brought back into the capital city. Now, at that point, as I mentioned, the, the size of the Navy, uh, the Chinese had 3,500 ocean-going ships. The U.S. Navy um, currently has 374. So, again, a perspective on that. Judy, when he died, he had named his eldest son, uh, Ju Guan Chi, who was a scholar. He was very bookish. He was not up for adventures. And so as soon as he took over, um, he lifted the tax burden on the peasants. He made some fundamental changes. He outlawed foreign adventures. And whereas, because the Confucian scholars had been so hard on Judy, Judy had demoted them and had elevated the eunuch court. There were always two forces within the, uh, the Chinese court. There were the scholars, the Confucian scholars, and the eunuchs. Well, um, Judy had really suppressed the Confucian scholars who were critical of him and had elevated the eunuchs, which is one of the reasons why Zhang He, a eunuch, became the general, the admiral of these ships. Well, his son, when he took over, he promoted the Confucian scholars rather than the eunuchs so that when the sixth fleet finally got back home, the sixth uh, trip of the treasure fleet, he declared there would be no more and there would be no more drain on the treasury. But he only lived nine months as emperor, and when he died, his son, who was 26 years old, took over, and his son was sort of a cross between the adventurous grandfather that he'd had and the bookish father. He was, he was a thoughtful guy, was not one to go off you know, in anger like his, like his grandfather Judy had done against the Tatars and others, but he did value um, all that the ships had brought back in terms of knowledge and understanding. And so at that point, he commissioned one more treasure fleet expedition, the seventh and final voyage in, in 1432. And he asked Zhang He, who at that point was 61 years old, to lead that voyage as well. So they went out on a seventh voyage with the largest fleet ever. At that point, Zhang He, on the voyage, Zhang He died, and he was buried at sea. Um, when he came back in, the, the emperor said, okay, that was, that's great, but we're not gonna do that anymore. In fact, shortly afterwards, they passed a law that they could not build any ships with more than two masts. Now, that's compared to the nine masts that the big treasure ships had. And um, a while after that, in 1525, they actually passed a law that all ocean-going ships were to be destroyed. And this was a period where they went into a, um, a, an area as a nation of seclusion, you know, this sort of closed Chinese society. Um, China and Japan both went through periods of uh, being secluded from the rest of the world. And so they destroyed all the ocean-going ships.
in the uh, early 1500s because they didn't want they didn't want people going out anymore, and they did not care about relations with other countries, which had been the primary motivation for the treasure ships. So the question is left: Did Zhang He and the treasure ships circumnavigate the globe? Did they discover America, South America? Did they discover Australia? Did they discover the Arctic and the Antarctic? Well. One thing that some people, including Gavin Menzies, point to as being evidence that they did is this map. This is an 18th century copy of what's purported to have been a 15th century map. So during the period of time after the treasure ships, right after the treasure ships, it is in Chinese and it has some distinctively Chinese characteristics. For instance, you can't really tell from there, but the seas are represented in sort of little wavelets. Uh, and that's how the Chinese would represent the sea in their maps. This map was bought by a Shanghai attorney who insists that, it's, that it is authentic, that it is an authentic reproduction of a 15th century map, and that it proves that Zhang He navigated both the Poles and the Americas, the Mediterranean, and even Australia. Um, this map shows that the world is a globe. This is why you get that, you know, the round effect. Uh, this is how they represented globes. And that the, it also identifies the Himalayas as being the world's largest mountains, the tallest mountains. It um, gives the lengths of the world's major rivers. It identifies the outline of the Arctic. Um, and all of that detail is on this map. And that's exactly the problem with it. Because the representation of the globe of the world like this was never used by Chinese at any other time. This was a European invention from uh, hundreds of years later. Not only that, but the amount of information that this map captures, like the length of rivers and the height of mountains, um, there's no way that they could have captured this much information in over a 30 year period of time, going out two to three years at a time. Uh, it took hundreds and hundreds of years to gather this much geographical information. How, for instance, do, uh, do a bunch of people on ships determine the height of the Himalayas? Um, it's a little bit of a distance from the sea, and these are seagoing ships, to the Himalayas. Um, and the length of the rivers and all that, there simply is too much geographic detail for them to have, have, even if they'd gone to all those places, they could have gone to all of them and mapped them and recorded all this data and gotten back within a 30 year period of time. It took hundreds and hundreds of years for this much data. Uh, the Arctic was not really discovered to this extent until the late 1500s. Uh, the Himalayas were not identified as the highest mountains in the world until the 19th century. And so um, the problem with all of this is that there's simply too much detail. There's too much claim. If they'd been a little less meticulous, <laughs> then it probably would have been accepted by more people. Uh, the Australian Broadcasting Network did a, uh, did a documentary which they called Junk History which is a play on words, of course, Chinese ships are called junks, in which they looked at all this and really, uh, really dismissed it as not being possible. But there are a lot of people who still buy into this. There are websites, Gavin Menzies has websites. As I say, he continues to identify the Chinese as having been responsible for enormous events like the Renaissance in human history, and maybe the internet. I don't know what his next book is gonna be, but we'll find out. Um, so this is why they, uh, this is what some of the claims are based on, but it's just too good. Um, uh, there, there's not really any way that that could be. Any questions about the Chinese treasure ships? A fascinating period of history. Yes? Well, Al Gore was Chinese. Okay, Al Gore was Chinese and he invented the internet, right. And, and long trousers, I understand. That was, that was part of his too. Um, other questions? Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So Marco Polo. Right. Um, so Marco Polo, who did visit China, and obviously his his record, that he didn't actually write the account of his of his travels. By the way. He was thrown in jail when he went back to Italy, and, and his cellmate, hearing all these stories, wrote them down for him. But um, Marco Polo came during the uh, time of Kublai Khan, which was the Yuan dynasty immediately before this, but 
uh, it's possible if you were, you know, uh, because this is early in the, the Ming Dynasty, then um, if he were there, it's possible he could have sailed on those ships. Uh, whether he went to Alaska or not would be a matter of, of serious conjecture. I mean, it's, it's, it's his description of what he saw. Of the description of what he saw, right. Um, yeah, I mean, we're going to Alaska. Uh, so, very possible, I guess. We'll, we'll never know for sure, uh, or maybe we will. Other questions? Yes, Pat. On that first slide, you had a large anchor. Mm -hmm. Was it made of metal or wood? It's made of metal, and that's why it survived. Um, wood would tend to decay. I mean, the reason that we don't, they scuttled all of the ships and, or burned them um, in most cases, and so we don't have any examples of the actual keels of the ships or anything like that, but we do have that um, the rudder that was wood, but it, it, at a certain period of time, depending upon what kind of uh, material it's in, if it's in clay or things, then they can survive. But the anchor was of metal, um, and so, and they were doing, you know, the Chinese had been doing metallurgy for centuries prior to this, so they were able to make um, iron and uh, other kinds of metal implements for the ships. Yes? The History Channel uh, in the United States had something about uh, round stones that were, uh, had like full stroke to them for anchors that were found off the coast. Right, uh, round stones with holes in them. There are a lot of ancient, in fact, before they had uh, metallurgical capabilities, before they could make iron or uh, other, see the problem with some metals is that they're too soft. As an anchor, it won't work because you just bend the tine. So it wasn't until iron that metal anchors really made a lot of sense. But the stone anchors have been used by civilization since the first boats were ever made, you know, because simply the weight of them would keep a, a smaller boat in place. And so, yes, there were, I'm not aware of that having been the case with the Chinese because they were far enough along, it's later, and they had the capabilities, they could make metal anchors. Now, they may have used stones for stability or for ballast or things like that, so that, that's certainly possible. 